Um, yes, my name is Arne Hens, Celia Renzig. Um, this is my first time in a month, so we'll see how our presentations, <laughs> co presentation goes, but I'm sure it will be fine. Um, so, yeah, we're both from Cardiff University in the UK. Um, and. <coughs> and there at the. Um, Cardiff School of Journalism, Media and Cultural Studies. Um, we've been working on a few projects related to education recently. Um, and we'll talk about one of them a little bit, and uh, the others not so much, we'll see. So, uh, one of our projects recently has been about uh, the implications of the Snowden revelations on digital citizenship. Um, another one has been on predictive policing. Um, and recently we launched uh, what we call the Data Justice Lab, a space for research and collaboration around uh, the question of social justice and, and uh, data education. More people coming? More people, maybe not. Um, still thinking. Morning. Because Stefania has a chronic sort of illness. <laughs> All right, so um, anyway, what we want to do based on this research, based on these projects, is to reflect a little bit on, on some of the broader implications and consequences of that work and of these uh, research findings, particularly on modification and the omnipresent uh, collection and analysis of data mean for our understanding of digital citizenship. Do we need to revise classic understandings of the concept? Um, what are the challenges of what we want to call a datafied citizenship? And so what we want to do here is first talk a little bit about uh, what is just generally what is digital citizenship, what, is, what do we mean by it, um, and then uh, a little bit about data collection and surveillance, what are current challenges to digital citizenship, and then uh, Lena will take over and talk um, a bit more about datafication, current trends that we need to incorporate into maybe our understandings of digital citizenship, and then going towards, uh, let's say, an idea of datafied citizenship. What does that actually mean and where do we end up uh, with this? So um, to, well, to, to think about digital citizenship, basically, what, what is it? Just a very brief um, outlook, overview, whatever. It means that our interaction with our social and political environment is increasingly mediated through digital technologies. We think of how digital tools and platforms are increasingly essential uh, for us to participate in society with, with everyday culture, through social media and through platforms like Airbnb and Uber and so on that we use, or some of us, um, or political engagement online and so on. We increasingly enter the sphere of civic activity and develop agency uh, through digital media. And why should we talk about citizenship in that sense, especially as maybe classic understandings of citizenship are really more about our rights and obligations in relation uh, to the nation state based on the citizenship that we have through our passport or sometimes through our birth um, and received in that sense. Um, well. If we look at other areas of research, especially from criti uh, critical citizenship studies, um, there scholars focus on a few other aspects, uh, particularly on the diversity of affiliations that we have, as we see here from the quote by, by Eisen and Brooklyn. Um, and secondly, um, on the aspect of performing and enacting politics, the citizen is really uh, performing uh, politics and their, uh, and, and their role in society themselves. It's a focus on achieved citizenship, not received citizenship. It's not about our blood or passport, but our actions. Um, and for digital citizenship, then this active and performed aspect is particularly relevant. Um, again, Eisen and Gruppert, in, in their book on digital citizenship, um, uh, call cyberspace an agon agonistic space of uh, relations and uh, struggles. Um, we are enacting ourselves through and in the internet, on the internet, and in cyberspace. And so as digital citizens, in that sense, uh, when we engage in things like um, citizen journalism, social media activism, uh, the surveillance of um, elites and institutions, uh, maybe acts of digital culture, if we think about political memes and, and so on, maybe other forms of civic and engaged use of digital tools, civic mapping, and so on, um, generally, perhaps, 
where digital citizens in using and applying what was termed liberation technology a few years ago, the, the positive and, and uh, empowering aspects of the internet. So digital citizenship has typically been discussed in this context of empowerment, how digital media have allowed us to raise our voice uh, and to be heard in social and public debate and have thereby uh, had a democratizing effect. Uh, and as it has suggested, therefore, a shift towards enhanced agency by citizens, democratizing trend in state citizen relations, and therefore, yes, a power shift towards citizens. But our enactment in cyberspace um, is only one side of the coin, as we know, and as we are discussing here at this conference. Um, and um, yeah, also when we talk about digital citizenship. Uh, and increasingly, we're waking up to the fact that we're also digital citizens because everything we do these data traces, and these data traces are analyzed by state and by corporate actors, and we're increasingly assessed and categorized and profiled according to these data traces. And the Snowden leaks were kind of a testament to this, and they provided proof of uh, comprehensive data collection of all our online communication and how this data is used by security agencies. And so we just want to point to <clears throat> Um, this particular project that um, briefly now for a minute that we concluded last year um, it was called Digital Citizenship and Surveillance Society um, and it was about analyzing the implications uh, of the Snowden revelations on four areas uh, media coverage, so whether we are well informed digital citizens, um, civil society, whether we are able and active uh, digital citizens the legal and regulatory framework, whether this framework enables digital citizenship uh, and technological standards, fourthly, whether they provide a secure infrastructure. <clears throat> and you can find all the results and publications on this website, um, ESSproject.net. But just a few outcomes in a nutshell, um, not so surprising, but just to, to point to a few, few aspects here. Well, media coverage, um, as probably many of us have experienced ourselves, has led very much to the normalization and justification of surveillance, uh, focusing mostly on questions of state security, and the consequences of the extent of mass surveillance for citizens have largely been invisible. Consequently, there is fairly little <laughs> knowledge and understanding of surveillance among the population or large parts of the population. Uh, people are worried, they do care, but they resign to the fact that they don't know what data is collected, for what purpose, how to protect themselves, how to resist. Um, policy reform in most countries has legalized and expanded mass surveillance and has empowered the state, um, for example, also to hack into all our devices. That's the current uh, discussion right now when uh, some governments are talking about what to do about WhatsApp and encrypted messaging services. That's, that's the solution where increasingly, uh, that direction where increasingly we're going. Um, actually, our interviewees said, like, hacking into devices or computer network exploitation and all these terms that are created about that is really the future of all this. Um, and technical infrastructure is a contested terrain in which intelligence agencies and technologists and businesses all try to influence underlying standards to, in, to varying degrees. Uh, so what can we say based on this about citizen empowerment through digital citizenship? Well. There's a lack of an informed enactment, enactment of digital citizenship. There's a lack of an enabling policy environment and secure infrastructure. Um, digitization actually advances the state's ability to monitor our activities. It therefore and thereby disciplines citizens. It's a mechanism of control, especially in fragmented societies. Um, citizen agency is constrained in that sense. And we could kind of see, yes, there is a form of a power shift uh, from the citizen to the state, um, contrary to classic understandings of, of um, digital citizenship. Um, so turning around this, this classic idea. So where, does, where do we go from here? Where does that leave us? Sorry? I might sit here because I... Okay. So, um, and also implies perhaps that we need to kind of reconsider how we then think of notions of, of citizenship. And then uh, we're talking about sort of data fight citizenship. So, first of all, I mean, David Lyon has written about uh, the kind of snow leaks as an as a indicator of, of something, a broader shift 
that he talks about the surveillance culture, but what he means also by surveillance here is datafication because the datafication is a way to be seen. And so therefore, um, we're, we need to shift this understanding of surveillance society, that, we, that the idea that surveillance is just done by someone onto others into a surveillance culture, that it's about actually a way of, of life. Um, so he says, from being an institutional aspect of modernity of a technology enhanced mode of social discipline, a discipline of control is now internalized and form parts of everyday reflections on how things are and of the repertoire of everyday practices. And then the thing to this also is that we're talking about broader transformation when we talk about datafication in also forms of governance and decision making, so the ordering of society. And we can think about what are the key aspects of, of datafied society and therefore what becomes the tenets of datafied citizenship. Because in some way, deification is a way of making populations legible in one way or another. Um, and if we think about what the tenets or aspects of deified society is, and in turn what citizenship then means, it is about identifying and profiling and sorting and categorizing. And we see examples of that in terms of sort of predictive policing, risk scores for predictive sentencing, health scores, scores in education and so forth, um, categorizing and uh, sorting people in different ways. And um, so we might think of political agency is given by the ability to identify and sort, and then political subjectivity is by being identified and sorted. Um, and it's about based on, on a shift of understanding and categorizing based on correlation and patterns where you try and predict what individuals might do based on group traits. So it's, it is about sort of aggregating in new ways and, and therefore trying to therefore predict and preempt certain types of uh, behavior. And of course, a key aspect of this is that it's being done largely away from the public eye, either because of through private corporations or internally within, within the state. And we have a lack of knowledge of how these categorizations are being carried out. So questions for citizenship, for example, um, become then key around how are populations then understood. And if we think about it, predominantly populations are, are understood in terms of what we know from sort of predictive policing and, and these types of developments as flat and decontextualized and ahistorical, which might also mean why we get certain uh, types of discrimination and so forth. Very difficult for these systems to account for the complexities of society. How are citizens categorized? Well, say in terms of sort of risks and threats and worth and waste versus, for example, categories we've had before when we thought of citizenship to do with like ethnicity or gender or socioeconomic status. It's become replaced with these new types of categories of understanding citizenship. And we might under try and ask questions about how are citizens represented? And here it's to do with this, what often gets talked about as a sort of data double. So these artificial representations based on often on, on group traits to create sort of an individual doppelganger, um, which has very complex relations between them, the collective and the individual. So what are the implications of this? Well, it, it certainly means that we have to think about citizenship beyond questions of, of surveillance and privacy, that these are much broader sort of societal questions around what happens to uh, datafied and datafied or with datafied citizenship. And one is the unevenness with these processes so that citizens are implicated differently, different groups are implicated differently in these because they also play off existing structural inequalities and power relations that we have in society. We also get the emergence of this new, new social stratifications between those who are able to profile and sort and identify versus who are then those who are subjected to those profiles um, and categorizations. Um, where there is, um, and source has written about this, as extreme legibility given to the sovereigns, whether those be states or corporations, versus then those who are subjects. And we also see the emergence of, of uh, political distances or kind of forms of alienation that arise between these artificial representations that are being created uh, and the categories that are, are, um, are used versus people's lived experiences. So the distance there between people's lived experiences versus how they're categorized or represented in terms of their data double. And there's also a distance between how we have traditionally protected aspects of citizenship in terms of, say, civic rights. So we'll be based around categories like gender and class and race and so forth, versus how these new categories, what's the distance there? Do we actually have protection in place um, for, um, 
understanding citizenship in our current <laughs> system. Um, and also an uh, implication around this idea of, of preemption becoming the operative logic of governance. Um, and the fact that people become governed based on a, a prediction around intent versus how citizens actually act. Um, so what does this mean then for citizen agency and for active citizenship? So if the question becomes how do citizens come to be seen and in turn then see themselves? Well, a lot of these systems have an inability to really account for, for distortion or unpredictability. And of course, one aspect in which we might think of active citizenship is to exploit these distances and therefore distort the system somehow. Or in terms of sort of positive feedback loop loops, so actually feeding back into um, these uh, systems in order to, for example, when there are processes of, of discrimination or exclusion, uh, because the system isn't able to account for complexity of social life, to actually feed that back in. And then the work that we have work, uh, are doing a lot with this data justice lab that we set up, is to actually try and, in terms of how we might deal with it in, as a in form of activism, or to sort of try and, and indicate how we need to shift the debate away from or beyond questions of, of individual privacy, and link up much more how processes of datafication are entangled with broader sort of questions of, of social and economic justice. So really making a link between how existing power relations and political agendas and interests and so forth are key to understanding why datafication happens in the way they do and what the consequences for citizenship might be. And so we talk about this as in terms of a kind of data justice movement that actually links question of data to question of economic and social justice and indicates the way in which these systems play to certain interests and therefore how we might want to challenge those types of interests. With that, actually, with that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nick Mignoni. I come from Cyprus. Cyprus University of Technology. <coughs> This is the title of, uh, of today's presentation, The Characters of Users' Everyday Life, uh, Revisiting the Soto to Understand User Agency. So, um, what I, I uh, want to talk, uh, talk about is uh, the algorithmization of the everyday, as uh, Wilson has called it. And um, it actually is about how uh, daily practices are being delegated as Latour would say, to algorithms, uh, more and more. You probably remember the Italian lab book, uh, of course. Yeah, it's an exam early example of that. Um, but um, although there is much work on how algorithms tend to constitute the everyday, uh, much less uh, 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 is uh, known to us yet about what uses the wave algorithms or two algorithms, as Bucher also proposed. So, uh, uh, looking for a framework to study user agency, we went back to the Soto uh, and his uh, uh, book, uh, uh, The Practice of Everyday Life, where he uh, theorized the practices of this common hero of life uh, uh, as he called uh, ordinary people and their practices. Uh, um, so we have two uh, basic aims. Uh, first, using the sort of theorization of everyday practices, we aim at tracing analogies and discrepancies between his top mechanisms to power and resistance, and the contemporary social media platforms and the users. And we use a preliminary analysis of um, an application which um, <coughs> um, it's a data activist um, uh, expression, I guess, and persona. And if we have time, I will explore some ideas about where to look and how to study these user practices. So <clears throat> I'm going to very quickly uh, summarize some basic uh, uh, main uh, concepts used by the Soto about power, and these are the proper and the strategies. So a key mechanism by which power holders impose an order, so she could order for the Soto, is the demarcation of a proper place, the proper. And strategies um, are the power holders and uh, objective calculations uh, which generate power relations as they delete their proper places. I will talk more about that in a moment. So what I try to do here is to extract some basic um, uh, characteristics of the proper 
and applied it to platform, to um, explore uh, platform power. And, and it looks like uh, um, that the Sotos uh, concepts are very well uh, fit <laughs> uh, for uh, analyzing platforms. For example, much like a city, platforms are predefined control spaces that are owned by the corporate, it's like a rented apartment, this is the, the metaphor that Sotos uses. Um, but uh, if we think about social media accounts, it's actually a rented space in the sense that the user can decorate it uh, a little bit or can inhabit it certainly, but cannot change fundamentally. Uh, also, platforms <coughs> exert this uh, kind of disciplinary control and uh, at hidden from place sites, uh, at ontological level, as Lars uh, has pointed out. Uh, Gale argues about how uh, platforms construct the uses and users, uses of the things and so on, and also uh, platforms can be seen as pervasive, as having no outside, as the short talk says. Those users cannot hop out with it, there is nowhere to go. And um, by the same token, we can speak about the strategies, and this is a very non exhaustive list, of course. I'm just mentioning business models, governance, technology, of course, and ideology. Following Van Gogh. Um, <clears throat> I move on to agency. Um, the Soto um, speaks about the subjects, the users, the consumers, and the tactics. And for the Soto, users are weak, are dominated. They have no choice but to submit and consent to their submission. However, they can resist the simulation. They can deflect the power of dominant order. They can escape without leaving it. Because they lack a place, they don't have a proper, uh, and because they lack a place, they can only engage in tactics. Tactics now are acts, uh, activities that are usually time-based, uh, temporary cracks in the system. They obey a different logic. Um, so it talks about the meetings, this painful suppression and ancient Greek uh, word for uh, kind of intelligence. They use the language in the forms of the established order. They are hidden and unforeseeable. They are imagined, affected, ontological. This author talks about thoughts and feelings a lot. Uh, and acts and decisions from not, but not discourses, full blown discourses. So you just make these trajectories and paths temporarily transforming the proper into a space. Um, this author at some point writes, in, uh, to, to understand and study the, the agency of, of uh, people, we must determine the procedures, basis, effects, and possibilities for this collective activity. And I'm going to look at the procedures uh, at this uh, presentation, namely tactics, acts. And um, to do this, um, I employ the, uh, the concept of imagining affordances, affordances, and also the related concept of oppositional uses by Shah. So imagining affordances, um, have uh, three characteristics that are very um, useful to us here. They depend on user's perception, they depend on their imagination, they are not fully realized in conscious rational knowledge, so we're talking about affective non-rational practices, and also because they are imagined, they entail possibilities for traditional action. All traditional action is what Sean talks about when she uh, adapts pure coach model, the model, the model to social media users, and she talks about hegemonic uh, and oppositional uses, use positions. Uh, hegemonic use position being the acceptance of the uh, idea of use position, and the oppositional uses um, uh, unexpected, unintended, or wrong uses. Okay. And three more attributes or tactics uh, from the short time. Uh, as I said before, the time based, the user language of the established order, order, and the underground. So, what I try to do is use this framework to analyze, to illustrate how uh, this will can be used to explore user agency through this example. The antipersona application, I don't think that somebody knows it, okay, it's a mobile phone application uh, which allows the user, once installed, to adopt another Twitter user's identity for 24 hours. Um, when you, you become someone else, uh, you can see the timeline, he sees uh, the same notifications, and, and so on. 
And the question is, in which ways is the persona, as an example, a, a tactic? And uh, does it enable opposition or use positions? Uh, how is the use of Twitter to be a persona to get on a wrong use? I'm going to make four uh, points, four arguments based on this example. First, that anti-persona affords us a very user sensitivity. Because if we look at Twitter, uh, as in which also we can put them, uh, is uh, this idea of use position, that a user should have a single, stable, consistent, and ideally real identity. And, and this is crucial to the business model of corporate social media. And the persona that suggests an unhelpful way of using Twitter, a means for again, engaging in identity play, abandoning one's social identity and experimenting with identity boundaries. And we can see this identity play idea in several ad features. <coughs> the motto of the education is the to user be everyone else. And once uh, the opening screen of the uh, mobile application features this question, who do you want to become? So it's, it's this endless possibilities of adopting a different identity. And then when I made a very obvious choice, I was the President Trump for the day, um, again, you can see uh, this uh, discrimination. Okay, you are currently Trump, President Trump. That's more than be someone else. So, you know, it, again, the idea of this online identity is ephemeral and transit. And this solution from the website is endless stream of possibilities for the user um, of anti persona. Um, okay, and so Twitter is being transformed uh, from a tool enabling. It's established hypothesis for two serving its own logic, namely this critical and self reflexive identity play. And this is not only an unintended use, but also an undesired use, in the sense that, in the sense that users, if users spend their time like this, of course they don't generate data, user and behavioral data that would feed the business model to the platform. So abandonment of personal identity even temporarily is part of the business. Um, second, and the person is a time based, going back to the sort of tactic, because it takes advantage of this opportunity, the app strategy, um, and it open, opens up this temporary crack in the system that is only shortly. So it does not transform the proper of the Twitter interface in any permanent or prolonged manner. And third, the sort of talks about how tactics work with the vocabularies of the established language and its prescribed syntactic forms. So which language does an persona speak? I think it's a heterogeneous text, in fact, in a sense, because it speaks many languages. For example, for example, it speaks the hegemonic language of the platform, which is the software and the syntax of the rules. Uh, it speaks the language of consumption because it can be found in iTunes store and it fits into the app economy, whatever that means. It means a lot. And it speaks also the artistic levels, not only because the developer is an artist and the application is an artwork, but also because it avoids imposing any single meaning on users. So it leaves the signification process open. And the fourth uh, claim of the Soto is that actors are clandestine, hidden, and unforeseeable. But are they? Uh, here, the answer points to the limits of user transaction in my view, because it is high to structure and closely monitored places of other platforms. Can user actions be private and more or untraceable? And that speaks to your presentation as well, because even errant and trans transgressive uses, uses are useful for marketers on the same. So user trajectories are turned into data. Uh, uh, in the same way, and process by algorithms, and so on and so forth. And there is another point, that's why right, critical point, made by Manowitz, that uh, strategies look more like tactics in Web2, while tactics look, look like strategies. And he talks about how platforms tend to incorporate and co-opt subalternate forms of expression, for example, the free products. And we have an example, a recent example here, for example, uh, uh, Google's decision to launch its own ad blocker to strip bad ads and clean up the web so that users won't have to install the real ad blockers uh, in Google Ads. For example, this is a protection example. 
and collective action. Collective action. Is it collective action? The Soto talks about how people, ordinary people with resistance, form a collective activity, a network of an anti-discipline. He calls it composed by ordinary people with different groups. But can we really speak about that and speak of a network of anti-discipline without mechanisms of collaboration and counter publics? Is it possible without some form of collective organization of user uh, resistance? Uh, many data activists, tools like the one I uh, used to take, others as well, like all random, um, uh, lack these mechanisms to communicate resistance collectively. So it's always at the individual level. Of course, there are more collectively oriented projects, like the one uh, the ones you can see there in the COVID case. And to an extent, it's a web to social media. Um, a question that is very interesting for me here is if data activism tools constitute the missing link between uh, individual user tactics. Um, and if I have some time and I don't see it, okay, that's good. <coughs> and, uh, a few remarks about some ideas about methods because uh, the empirical study of user agency is very difficult to study. There are a lot of methodological challenges. And I found some inspiration in a Christian Latour. Uh, who identified four conditions under which description, the process of untangling the, the script, uh, can be um, um, are possible. The exotic, the breakdown, the historical, and the delivered experimental bits. And these are some ideas about how, to, how we could proceed with this guiding. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, the exotic position there is when users are faced with a new foreign setup. So movies could be really uh, useful, right? Because they're in privileged position to observe how the process and react to inscribed user constants. And also this can be reconstructed in laboratory settings. Um, an example is Chris and Gale's um, recent um, analysis of Pinterest, where they analyzed sign up interfaces as a key moment of orientation and training. And then the breakdown position situation, where instant, uh, instances where the system logic becomes apparent and its rules become the non realized. So they are extreme enough to stir users negative emotions. And there have been uh, such uh, situations. Uh, and reactions like this can be found unprotected in online spaces, especially like the big changes like the reactions, the introduction of the reactions uh, on Facebook. The user says, hey, this is a fine, and all you want is this. So it's, it's, um, it's this big change that usually um, uh, make people uh, uh, speak about algorithms and platforms or be artificial constructed. They have to be tools are very uh, important because they create these breakdown situations and facilitate the proposition of users. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the historical situation, again, we can um, um, uh, envisage a uh, digital ethnography of all of users. I'm a big fan of collaborative auto ethnography because it can, it can provide a window to utilize the abundance of data available in our own feeds and inboxes and databases, or even repurpose um, data mining and HCI tools like eye tracking, which can be put in a different uh, completely different views, like to discover patterns of unexpected views. Um, see how users avoid certain features in a website. And uh, lastly, the delivery of experimental friction. And this can happen at two levels. At the level of the user as well, because users, as amateur, <coughs> make these attempts to reverse engineer social media. We can see this in Twitter's uh, paper, patient paper, for example, to extract mental models or how other work they develop some tactics to counteract them or of course design by experimental and studies. So to conclude, um, recent uh, rights that studies of the everyday are about rendering the seemingly invisible visible and explore power relations. And I think that the Soto um, provides us with some concepts uh, that uh, we can use to think uh, about the mundane everyday in new ways. And if a uh, uh, couple with a potent theory uh, can write a bit research that is critical yet is not to start with this agency. 
because there are many open questions, how do tactics affect users' activities? Do they affect the algorithm systems themselves, and so on? And uh, my last remark is that, of course, it's just as important to avoid the pitfall of seeing uh, common heroes everywhere. Confirmed, 
um, and finalized and then uh, remediated or uh, deleted sites. Um, so once they're added, these, these sites also get called to the front sites. Um, it's a very contested process in the United States. Um, you know, how something gets deemed a site, uh, what the cleanup process that gets um, agreed upon, and then how that consultation process uh, happens, and then the eventual remediation, kind of are all these uh, stages where, um, you know, there's been tensions of uh, competing interests, and so, uh, and often, you know, the challenge of not being enough funding. Um, so uh, lately, there's been this sort of community um, consultation process that's been added on, so there's this like officially enfranchised mode that the community can engage with it. Um, but uh, again, that may be not being seen as enough. There's been these additional uh, community uh, mappings or documentings to sort of be brought to bear on that. Um, and Haiti Wamish started as one of those, and kind of moved more into actually direct engagement and, and, and being part of that process. Uh, and so th their goal um, was just kind of to sort of what, how they framed it later on was that they wanted to ensure that the 342 million for the cleanup is well spent. Uh, and so using the community monitoring system, um, they, they had developed and deployed an internet mapping platform where individuals submit reports in the form of observations, questions, complaints. Um, and then they also organize those reports alongside other data, as sort of official forms of data, most of it taken from EPA approved cleanup plan. There's some community vision documents that were like the agreed upon community vision, uh, as well as um, uh, land and historical open data. Um, so the development of this platform and the data that you know, seems to have emerged out of this uh, language and trend towards openness, um, and the public data is released uh, from different sources using an open license, gets sort of layered on top of that uh, is this more community. Uh, oriented data and sort of building the practices around that collection. So they posted events to sort of have people walk along um, the canal and sort of add the reports and sort of engage in other ways, including um, art projects and stuff, because this is a multi-year cleanup for the next 10 years. Uh, so another project of that, uh, another project uh, in the same vein is Guanas Canal, and this sort of connects in with Public Labs balloon mapping. Um, so, um, Guanas Canal is based in Brooklyn, and Public Lab is an online distributed community that also holds like network in-person events called barn raisings, where people learn how to investigate environmental concerns using inexpensive, you know, often open source DIY techniques. Um, so Public Lab started uh, in the wake of the BP oil disaster when people were trying to collect their own data because there was a lockdown and what data was officially released. Um, they were using cameras and originally attaching them to kites and then uh, balloons. Um, and so a balloon mapping kit came out of it, but they went through this really uh, you know, community-based iterative process of testing, deploying, discussing, and improving. And that's been their like, longest standing kit, but they also have many other projects, including uh, the technology to knit together the images from this, because what you would get is a series of stills like that. Then you have this famous map leader program that you push together, and then you would have like, a larger uh, image. Um, and so the Guanas Canal uh, was created in the 1800s, and again, it's sort of on the it's the site of a former salt marsh in the creek, hissing its fair share of environmental uh, issues. There's sort of three main sources of pollution: industrial, sewer overflow, and then uh, surface runoff from related businesses. So it's an ongoing problem, not sort of an old one that's been carried forward. Um, and there's a canal conservancy group that, as an independent uh, organization formed by people who were involved in the original environmental community of the Canal Community Development Corporation. Um, and so they're sort of positioning themselves as stewards of this space, and they hold these seasonal uh, Guanas low area mapping events, GLAMs, which is a good name. Uh, and they sort of work closely with Public Lab, but Public Lab is also distributed in sort of, you know, regionally across the states and internationally. Um, so they, they kind of grab more seasonal pictures uh, and then do, do comparisons longitudinally and looking at, and a lot of times it's sort of surface uh, color and stuff to trace um, pollution. And then the last project, uh, I, I wanted to speak something a little more open hardware focused, um, is this thing called Dustwino, which was an open source project based on an Arduino, uh, which is an open uh, hardware uh, um, uh, microcontroller, like a small computer, a single board computer, and then deploy these low cost air quality centers um, Originally worldwide, but it started in um, Sao Paulo um, as part of this project that was called the Make Sense Project, but it explicitly was seeking to develop 
journalist-led environmental monitoring, so connecting um, in the city journalists to data to speak to air quality issues. So um, in these cases, I think uh, I, I would make the claim that there is uh, non-traditional forms of data collection, um, yet in a way that still um, can be or attempts to be made salient to existing decision-making processes. It's really heavily in the Hayduamish and Guanas Canal stuff. I mean, it's really run in parallel to uh, UK Superfund community consultations. Um, those kind of really coming out of an environmental justice or environmental advocacy background. Um, there's been a lot of cases of like bucket brigades and, and other forms of air quality mining. I'm getting to the point where it is able to be used in legal, like regulatory proceedings. So how how they get to the point where a community-based data collection can also be uh, you know, even though it's not done according to the same protocols that are established by these uh, regulatory bodies, speak again um, to those concerns. Um, and then they also, I, I guess the part that I'm still really working through and trying to think about is maybe the ways in which they enact uh, distributed forms of agency. So, you know, in the processes of constructing data through the sort of building, questioning, and refashioning of the systems itself, um, thinking about maybe at, at sort of deciding that boundary of what gets Collected, so you know, not having to like only uh, you know, in the case of some of the air quality stuff, you only test at a certain number of intervals, you throw away a certain amount of the results. There's like a form of testing that's almost, like used um, for for some types of proceedings, but you don't have to follow those rules. You kind of make your own like set of this is how I'm going to collect stuff, and a lot of times you just try and collect as much as possible. Uh, or in the case of Hayduamish, where you're looking at um, you know community reports, those maybe aren't following a template, and it's much more free form, and how people can you know, add in a qualitative uh, account and have that count as a record. Um, and then finally, I think the part that I'm sort of still struggling the most with but really excited about is the ways that they can sort of operate at different scales. Um, so I think instead of moving away from like an individual model of crowdsourcing, and I think in that language of crowdsourcing and citizen science, it's sort of this, you operate on a platform as an individual. Um, and sort of thinking about how um, these modes, uh, these, these projects speak to a way to move away from that and think about how you can explore operating at, like, at the scale of a community. Uh, I just put some of the cool pictures of other projects in between. Um, so yeah, I guess then with, with that in mind and sort of reflecting on uh, the outcomes of my uh, previous work, I was kind of trying to approach like what are impossibilities or that I that could be investigated through design. Um, so I think one thing, uh, which I would like to sort of bring forward is this way, a more participatory way of forming publics. So this is sort of publics in a Deweyan sense, um, which I think has you know, been pulled forward by a lot of uh, HCI scholars recently. So in attempting to trace the possibilities and inhibitors of collective political action, a public is grounded in concrete situations, experiences, and materiality of everyday life. Um, I think DeSalvo uh, sort of speaks uh, really well to uh, opportunities to see design as a way to scaffold groups of people getting to like form around a concern. Um, and also I think within HCI uh, there's a bit of a shift moving away from seeing design or, or wanting to move away from design as being extractive and really pulling knowledge out of a situation and instead having it, you know, kind of getting away from this modernist frame and being like sort of transactional or product oriented and kind of look at it as being about relations between people and communities. Um, so Lodato, I would say his last name wrong, um, uh, and, and, and his uh, sort of approach to social design is um, thinking about brokering shared dependencies and commitments um, amid different groups of people. Um, so I, I think there's a way that you know those practices already uh, in, the, in those projects kind of speak to um, participation and sort of the way groups have formed around these issues. Um, that wouldn't have been afforded if there hadn't been this design component to the data collection systems. Um, the second one is to sort of think about how you can scaffold uh, participation uh, in data practices. So I think, um, again, just drawing from DeSalvo, um, this neighborhood networks project where, um, you know, it, instead of having a, a designer uh, speak to people and go away, uh, you know, working with residents in the community over a course of many weeks to actually, like, um, prototype and try out and then iterate and then work together to sort of agree upon a mode uh, for actually collecting data and then what kind of data that should, what kind of data they want to collect um, in, in a context. And that one I think they wound up building like this really cool robot, um, which is, I don't know. 
Uh, and then the last part is maybe thinking about design as a way to critically investigate expertise uh, and reskill and reskilling um, potentials. So I think uh, a, a really cool model that actually is sort of located in citizen science um, and, and particularly DIY biology um, is, is this approach of like sketching practices. So it's like sketching building of biological organisms and, and thinking about how that could extend traditional things. Um, uh, Kutznov has a paper looking at traditional cooking practices like bread making and how you sketch into experimenting with fermentation practices. So there's a way that you link from existing skills and then extend that into you know a, a adding skills and or like reskilling a practice that might have been de-skilled. Um, and then uh, the other example I have there is really around bioremediation. So the way that um, it, within DIY bio people are kind of extending from growing plants into looking at uh, investigating using plants for remediating pollution. Uh, so the last thing I kind of wanted to end on uh, some references, is, is maybe just thinking about um, the questions of um, kind of that were raised in both presentations about this, like, this questions of uh, how you want to relate data to economic and social justice issues, but I think there's a, a really cool potential to relate it to environmental justice issues as well. And then also um, understanding a move from tactics to collective action. I, I think that that's sort of a, a place where maybe design could, you know, intervene or understanding how you could use design as a process um, could sort of push things towards collective action. So that's all I got. Thank you.